Hey, hi, hello, Hardwood Knox listeners. I am Dan Valley coming at you with my super duper, incredibly esteemed, awesome times awesome, fantabulous, spectaculario is definitely not a misinformed, uninformed troll of an NBA analyst co-host, Andrew D. Bailey. Before we get started, we have our usual housekeeping notes. First and foremost, pretty, pretty, pretty please continue rating, reviewing, and subscribing to Hardwood Knox on iTunes. We can also be found wherever else you're consuming your podcast. Rate, review, subscribe to us there. iTunes is still the best way to let us know you're out there and you're listening. So if you are using another player or getting your podcast elsewhere, uh, we'd be doubly appreciated, appreciative if you also rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes, especially now because uh, we had an influx of poor reviews since the last podcast or since Andy wrote about the Kyle Kuzma trade rumors, which wildly unfair takes for us. I mean, we're bad, but these were just mean. So if you want to come and, and help us get those ratings up, those good reviews, we'd, we'd really, really appreciate it. Follow the show on Twitter at Hardwood Knox. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube.com, search Hardwood Knox. We'll show up, subscribe, like our videos or podcasts are dropping there and sometimes a little extra. Follow Andy on Twitter at Andrew D. Bailey. Follow me on Twitter at at Dan Favale, F-A-V-A-L-E, and the podcast network Blue Wire can be found at Blue Wire Pods. I'm always tweeting out straight fire to trashy tweets over there all the time. So all that out of the way, Andy, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Um, I, I am not deterred by the Lakers fans every time I get an assignment from the editor, the editors that asked me to talk about the Lakers, I'll just go ahead and keep being honest. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. Hopefully the, uh, hopefully our people who actually listen to the podcast will heed your call to action there and, and give us some real reviews. Yeah, that, uh, the reviews, clearly they didn't even listen to the podcast because no. uh, one of them was mad about something we didn't even talk about in regards to Kyle Kuzma. And then I was surprised, I didn't read your Kyle Kuzma article uh, so I was surprised, like you weren't that critical of him on the podcast. So I did not, uh, I, like I was, when I was reading them, I was like, wow. So I guess they were just mad that like, you know, I, maybe he is valuable. Maybe he's not like, I don't know what his trade value actually is on its own, but the, the influx of, of anger was definitely unwarranted. And just a reflection that Kyle Kuzma continues to be covered and treated like a star when, He's really not that. Someone who's probably, he's a good score. Not probably, he, he could be a good scorer. I think there's a lot of stuff he can do on ball. I wrote a little bit about last year, how I do think, uh, maybe not so much this year, but you know, looking at what he did last year, he was trying really hard to me on defense. However, I don't think that you should be insulted by offers that include Bogdan Bogdanovich or Jay Crowder. Like These are just trade proposals. So uh, chill would be my advice to anyone who's just, <laughs> He was just really mad about the Kyle Kuzma takes. Yeah, I think chill is probably good advice for a lot of people who follow the NBA, especially the ones who spend time on Twitter. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, uh, speaking of takes, though, we are going to get to our trade target series. Uh, I said to you I thought we were going to hold off on it, but the rumor mill started to get a little a little spicy, and so I figured – uh, that the later, the longer we waited, uh, the easier it would be to, to outdate this stuff. So we've come up with tr- trade target suggestions, not end all be alls, just just our trade target suggestions for each team. We are starting with the Western Conference. Uh, where did you want to start? I'll throw it to you. Did you want to go alphabetical order, reverse alphabetical order? Um, let's go alphabetical. All right, Dallas Mavericks. Who do you got for I, them? I think this one's pretty obvious and I'm not real original in saying this, but I think they should go after Andre Iguodala. Um, you know, another wing who can defend for them has, has certainly been in more big moments than a guy like Dorian Finney Smith, who's been good this year. Um, but I think they're, they're one, uh, sort of veteran knows what he's doing piece away from jumping into that next tier. They've, they've been faltering a bit in the last few weeks. You know, they're obviously going to make the playoffs. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think many people would consider them a legitimate title contender, and I'm not sure Andre Godala would do that for them. Um, but I think he he checks a lot of boxes. He gives them a guy who can defend a bunch of different positions. He can knock down big shots and big moments. Um, I don't know. It just it just seems like sort of a natural fit there. Yeah, he's 
he, he's certainly someone who could fit. I tend to be a little bit lower on the acquisition of Andre Godala than most, just because he's going to turn 36, hasn't played basketball since Yeah, that's June. a concern. Yeah. Uh, the Mavericks, though, like you said, they've they've dealt with injuries over the past month or so, and so that's where they've really slipped off. And with the, the news about Porzingis' injection in his right knee, uh, we don't know how he's just going to respond for missing time when he'll really be back. I. I, I do wonder how aggressive they'll be at the deadline unless they just are confident that he's going to be super healthy. Luca puts them on that just let's go get it now timeline. And so I'd like to see them maybe go after. I don't think they have the juice to get a Robert Covington, but I think they can lean towards the defensive end of the spectrum just because Doncic is so good at carrying their offense. So a Thaddeus Young is someone that I've pegged for them. Uh, I actually wrote about that a little bit and there was mixed reactions from Dallas fans. Trevor Reza in Sacramento Hasn't really been shooting too well this year, but maybe you can just get more out of him in, in a better better offense. Uh, and then even a guy like Tony Snell in Detroit, if they're going to actually hold their their fire sale, someone who matches up perfect, almost perfectly with Courtney V's salary. He's going to try hard on defense, might struggle a little bit against bigger wings, but he can shoot the three as well. And so th- those are the types of names that, that I would peg for them. And, and finding a strong defender to me, on the perimeter w- would be a pretty big deal for them if they are at all concerned about Porzingis' health moving forward because of how important he just is to their to their defense. And obviously, you know, Trevor Reese is not going to help your rim protection, but Thaddeus Young can be all over the place. He has great hands. Uh, so I-, I think that they do need to kind of lean toward toward that end of, of the scope when they are shopping. Yeah, totally agree with all that. Who do you have for the Denver Nuggets? Um. I, th- I feel like I could go with Iguodala again. Spoiler alert, there's a lot of teams that could probably use Andre Iguodala, but notwithstanding all the concerns that you brought up, which I think are all fair. Um, one one name that I like for the Nuggets, and I'm not sure if I'm in love with it, but I think it's something that they should at least explore. And it, it was talked about after uh, news of his maybe being available. What broke is, is Drew Holiday. Um, he's not... He's around the same size as Gary Harris. I think he's probably a better defender. He's he's a better scorer right now. I don't know what's happened to Gary Harris's offense in the last couple of years. And it's not that Drew Holiday is lighting the world on fire from three. He's had his own struggles from behind the arc over the last few years. Uh, but I do think it's a talent upgrade for Denver. And I think he would be really good in that cutting system, cutting off of Nikola Jokic's high post touches, uh, top of the key touches. Um and I think Denver is just kind of ripe for a consolidation trade of of some kind. They've got a lot of talent, probably 11 or 12 legitimate rotation players. Um, and I think they're a team that's closer to legitimate content, contention than Dallas. So if they're able to add a guy who can make some meaningful contributions in the playoffs, I, I think that actually does take them into the status of legitimate title you know, contending team. I totally agree with you. And... Sort of the way I approached this is I tried to keep it whether I thought players were actually going to be moved or at least available um, to be selected. And so Drew Holiday would be a no-brainer for me. I just don't – I'm just not sold on the Pelicans actually moving him. But if he were available, that's the type of guy I think for the Nuggets you go all in on. Failing that type of level of acquisition – and so while I've, I probably will throw out multiple names for teams, Thaddeus Young was my pick for the Mavericks. And then for the Nuggets – I kind of feel like the semi-recent emergence or playability or willingness for Malone to play him, uh, Michael Porter Jr., gives them some flexibility to where maybe they don't need to get another shot creator. They can focus more on wing defense, uh, someone who can hit the three ball. And their defense has not really been that good since Nicole Jokic has started going kaboom. I like Robert Covington. For them, I feel like he's someone you know that he can work off the ball on offense and then gives you sort of another go-getter on defense. And he's worth consolidating, you know, not making a Drew Holiday level offer for, but he's someone who's worth, you know, giving up maybe one of your young players who are nearing free agency plus plus a pick. And I know the Nuggets situation is kind of complicated by not having this year's first round pick. So it does depend on the price point, but I do feel like they're one of the teams that could make among the most competitive offers for him. If they really can't get into this, let's say they get up it for him or if Minnesota's not willing to move him, they could probably move a little bit towards the, the lower end of the ladder. Again, I mentioned Tony Snell already. Maybe you talked to the Knicks about Reggie Bullock, who's been shooting well since 
Uh, he made his season debut. I'm with you, though. If Drew Holiday is available, that's someone that I do think for the Nuggets is, is worth going all in on. And and I, I think you gave the proper disclaimers there. If New Orleans continues to play the way they have recently and they get Zion Williamson back this month, the, the chances of him being available are probably pretty slim. And, and David Griffin refuted the reports that he was available basically the, the moment they came out. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's a, certainly a long shot, but I think it's something that Denver should at least, and maybe they already have, something that they should be exploring. Yeah, New Orleans, since Derek Favors has rejoined the rotation, has been like sort of bonkers. Good. They're tenth, <laughs> tenth in offensive efficiency, eleventh in defensive efficiency, seven and sixth, and sixth in net rating. And they've been even better since Lonzo Ball, over the past like three weeks or whatever, has just decided to go nuclear. He's been he's they're, been great for them. They're thirteen and twenty five, and their chance of making the playoffs at five thirty eight is up to forty five percent. That's still wild to me. <laughs> um, and they've got a really easy remaining schedule. So if they get Zion back and he's full strength, they're they're going to be interesting for sure. Who do you have for the Golden State Warriors? Uh, this is kind of a cop out, and it, I'm not sure it's it's my target because I don't know how realistic it is, but I want to talk about it. Um, I'm sure you saw the Marcus Thompson report about a potential D'Angelo Russell for Ben Simmons, Simmons swap. Um, that seems like the no brainer of all no brainers to me for the Warriors. I, I don't, I, I guess I kind of see the logic of it from Philly's perspective. Um, you, you get a guy who can certainly stretch the floor more than Ben Simmons does. And it, it creates for some intriguing pick and roll combinations with him and Joel Embiid. But, uh, I, <laughs> I don't, I can, and I also couldn't tell by the report if that was sourced or if it was just something that he was throwing out there. Um, so, <laughs> in in so much as Ben Simmons might actually be available, I it makes all the sense in the world for Golden State to throw D'Angelo Russell and whatever else needs to be put in that deal to make it happen. Um, I, I'm just not sure how realistic that is. It's definitely not going to happen this season. I, I think you can make the case that the deal in theory, makes sense for, I might even say Philly more so than Golden State. And that's not a shot at Ben Simmons. I just don't, I think you run into a lot of the same issues if you play Draymond Green with Ben Simmons as you do with Embiid with Ben Simmons. Unless Green's all of a sudden going to be a, a really good shooter or something. And he doesn't yeah. mind operating from the perimeter, so perhaps uh, that helps. But regardless, that's something that has to be explored over the offseason just because you have Simmons' poison he pill. I was going to say he can't be traded this season, or can he? He he theoretically can, but the, the rules on it are just, they make it impossible. So basically, he is worth to the Sixers as a matching tool what his salary is this year. But for his incoming team, they have to treat him like the average annual value of his of his deal in sum, whether oh, it be this year okay. and the extension. And so if he were to be moved, it's certainly not going to be to the Warriors. And, and so it's just not going to happen this offseason. I... It is one of those ideas, though, that's interesting to think about. You know, over the off season, maybe Philly flames out in the playoffs. We know Golden State's trying to extend its title window, and that no one really thinks D'Angelo Russell's long for them. They they feel like there could be a lot of interesting, uh, just scenarios and hypotheticals for them over the summer. For the Warriors, and this was applied to like any team that I think is so obviously going to be sellers. I I just sort of. I, I sort of defaulted to can they take flyers on young players or young yeah. wings? And so for them, I went with uh, Juan Hernan Gomez or Malik Beasley, maybe even. I have I have both of those guys listed as well. I, I don't. It's tough It's just because they're so hard capped, like just so close to mm -hmm. it that it, the money has to be almost perfect. And I'd be curious what the price tag would be. I don't think Juan Hernan Gomez runs you much just because he's not. He's clearly not a part of Denver's plans. I You still might need to send out two players to match his salary, though. And so that's where things get a little iffy, because who do the Warriors have that Denver would want? And so could you build something around Glenn Robinson and someone else? Is it even worth giving up Glenn Robinson for Hernan Gomez? I think it might be just because you don't have GR3's bird rights next year. Could you put something together for Malik Beasley, even, who hasn't played just a super ton. He's been, his usage seems inconsistent. He's, he's shooting the ball well from three. He is playing a little bit more now, but does Denver want to pay him? And is there something you could build around GR three for that? I honestly don't know on the super low end. Uh, 
can you just try and get someone who's might might just be a wing to evaluate on defense? Where's Dwayne Bacon? And perhaps that doesn't cost you uh, a GR three. At least it shouldn't because Bacon doesn't even really play in Charlotte. So that something like that would be. I think where the Warriors are at, mostly I think they're sellers where they would be on the hunt for, for second round picks. When you look at the players, they would be giving up though. Yeah. I, I'm with all that prior to sort of digesting that Marcus Thompson piece. I, I was on a similar um, trajectory with the Warriors, just guys that are still young, have some talent, maybe didn't, didn't really get a, a chance to fully show what they can do on their current teams. And, and the Nuggets guys just jumped out to me for them as, as possibilities. Yeah. The, the other way I thought they could go is like, are there super cheap veteran wings that maybe they could put two contracts together for and get, and so that they help them more next season when they're presumably full strength. But I couldn't even figure out workable scenarios for like a Jay Crowder. Uh, it's even tough for them to get like a Reggie Bullock. So mm-hmm. It's just a Reggie Bullock. Sorry, I always mispronounce his name. So I, it's I, again, it's they're more so sellers. Where can they maybe get some second rounders? But if they are on the hunt for actual talent, I, I do think you know the route that you just talked. That's something that that that's the path they should go down. All right, Houston Rockets. Um, so I have I have a bunch of possibilities for them. Um, I, I think there's always a chance that they'll do something wild. As long as Daryl Morey's there, it seems like he sort of doesn't, you know, he doesn't leave any stone unturned. Um, so <laughs> a few weeks ago when I was actually preparing an article, I thought, are they a, are they a possible Kevin Love destination? And I don't, I'm not in love with that idea. Um, it would cost them some guys that are really important to their defense. Um, you know, I think he probably raises the offensive ceiling a little bit, but but not enough to sacrifice the defense they would have to, to get him. And then they're stuck with some of the worst contract situations in the league with him and Westbrook, if they do that. Um, so some smaller sort of on the fringes targets that I think might make sense for them and accomplish similar things. I think Marvin Williams is a good force spacer. Um, can, can defend, I think a little bit out on the perimeter. He's, you know, he's getting older, uh, but I think he's still a decent three and D defense kind of a guy. Jay Crowder, similar. Um, situation I, th- I think Houston regardless of who comes into that team and we've seen this played out with Russell Westbrook is it the, the system is going to continue to be James Harden um, they they brought in another one of these historically high usage guys and it's still just everything runs through James Harden now they're a lot faster this year their pace is I think they went from 26 last season to second this season. So the style has changed a little bit, but at its core, it's, it's always going to be James Harden. So the best guys to surround him with, I think continue to be these sort of three and D guys who have decent size can guard a bunch of different positions. Um, they're not going to be upset about having to stand on the perimeter and just wait for the kick out and shoot. I mean, they're, they're not going to demand more touches and more opportunities to create for themselves from the front office or the coaching staff. Um, and so I think, those are the kind of targets that they should be looking at. Guys like Marvin Williams, uh, Jay Crowder. I don't know. You may have some other guys in that vein that that would make sense for Houston. Yeah, they're, you're, the point about their pace, too, is just so salient. They're second in average possession time, and that's up from 22nd last hmm. year in average possession time. We're talking about a difference of uh, less than two seconds, but that's still a huge jump. And so that's an element that Russell Westbrook has helped them tapped into if you're looking for nice things to say about Russell Westbrook. I just don't I'm I'm with you on your targets. My my pick for them would be Reggie Bullock just because he's on the cheaper side. Jay Crowder is right there as well. They just don't have the pieces to do or the salary filler to do anything major. And so, you know, you talk about a Kevin Love deal or even let's go smaller scale when looking at the salaries. Robert Covington, someone they've been linked to in perpetuity this season who are you moving for him? It would have to be PJ Tucker and someone else because you're not dealing Westbrook or Harden in that scenario. Clint Capella makes under 15 million, but Minnesota's not going to have any interest in him. I also don't know. You can move Clint Capella for a wing, but I don't know if, if it would make, if you're, we're talking Robert Covington, I don't know that that would make sense. Eric Gordon can't be moved after signing his extension. And just like that, we're at PJ Tucker without him. Their next most expensive player is Daniel house. Uh, at 3.5 million and so you need to cobble together uh, more than two contracts to meet 
the Covington threshold. And so that's why I think someone like a a Bullock, who's only on the books for four million this season, or Jay Crowder, who's closer to the eight million range, that's probably their their ceiling on a deal. And it does help that they can trade this year's first round pick, but again, cobbling together the necessary salary filler is so tough. And because the Nene contract, which I forgot about for a hot minute while I was writing something the other day, but because it's not actually worth how it was signed with all those uh, likely incentives, that hamstrings you even further. Yeah, they're they're in an interesting situation for for sure. Uh, I do like Marvin Williams there, and I actually don't think yeah. anyone's going to move for him unless Charlotte takes on longer-term money. And so Houston or maybe a Boston or maybe even a Portland, those feel like really good buyout destinations for him should he get to that point. Yeah, for sure. You have the Clippers. Who do you got for them? You ready to get weird? Oh, I'm ready to get weird. <laughs> I I feel like I could just fall back on Andre Iguodala for a bunch of these teams. I've already said that. And I, I think he does make some sense for the Thunder. And spoiler alert, he makes some sense for the Lakers, even though they don't really have the pieces to go and get him. Um, but for the Clippers, <laughs> again, let's get weird. I'm going to throw Chris Paul out there. What is going on right now? <laughs> Um, speaking of teams that have been, uh, you know, better lately and are charging into the playoffs, we, we, we mentioned that with the Pelicans, the same thing for the Thunder. And I, and, you know, there's, I think they would still probably unload Chris Paul's contract in a heartbeat if someone gave them a good, um, out. The Clippers can get there with Beverly Harkless, Jermichael Green and Jerome Robinson. I don't even know if you'd need to include picks because of, you know, Chris Paul's age, length of the contract. This is all stuff that we've discussed over and over and over. Um, <laughs> Obviously, this move would just uh, put a crater in the Clippers' depth, uh, but there's no question he's a better point guard than Patrick Beverly. All of a sudden, the star power with CP3, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, Montrezl Harrell, Lou Williams. I mean, you still have the top four guys that are on the team right now. Um, they become just a, a juggernaut, if they're not one already. Uh, but certainly, a four-for-one trade in the middle of the season is not ideal when it comes to roster construction and, and team building. No, you would definitely need to get our third, <laughs> third and fourth teams involved for that. I have trouble buying into that one. I just don't. I don't blame you. <laughs> so what was the proposal? Beverly, Harkless. Beverly, Harkless, Jermichael Green, and Jerome Robinson makes it work under the CBA. That that gets you there. That's not the, I, I mean, the one that's toughest to give up, obviously, would be Patrick Beverly. And I do wonder the thing that was tough for me is, is Darren Collison going to go there? Uh, you know, that, yeah, that's a consideration for sure. And maybe, maybe he makes more sense after this trade because suddenly you need bodies on the, on the roster. That's true too. But then all of a sudden you have Lou Williams and Chris Paul and Darren Collison. I, I, I see the need for a playmaker on this team because the minutes that Paul George has played without, Kawhi and Leonard actually have not been great. The offense has been fine. It's been the defense that's been the problem. So maybe you could just say they need an upgrade over Mo Harkless. I, I would be here for the Chris Paul deal, if only because that is just so way, way, way out there. I would love to see what the results were. I just I, I would have trouble fathoming it. Uh, for them, I feel like maybe if they wanted to go a similar route, a Thomas Sadoransky from Chicago would work. Uh, he's my first pick for them. Yeah, not the best defender, but at least has some size and they can trade their own first round pick this year. So if you attach that to Harkless, or maybe it's a combination of seconds with Harkless, or maybe it's Robinson and, and Harkless, uh, the setup for the deal. If they wanted to just go a little more like, I, I don't even know what the word would be just a, someone who's not going to maybe have the balls less, but can run stuff in a pinch. I I'd be curious to see what the price is for, for Luke Kennard in Detroit. Um, if they're going to get Collison, though, I don't know that you need another ball handler. And so I think they're a team that should enter the, the Robert Covington sweepstakes as well. I know he's a name that we're tossing out in volume, but it's because he basically fits everywhere. And he's someone who, you know, with his team defense, maybe helps you navigate those minutes when Kawhi Leonard is, is off the court. But he's also someone who can handle more three-point volume than, than a Mo Harkless. Yeah. I completely agree, and I think it's fine to throw out Robert Covington in volume. If he's really available, I think there's a lot of teams that could benefit from having him. 
Yeah, I'm totally with you. I, I want to see... I, I don't know whether Minnesota is going to move him, and I, I don't even want to venture a guess. If they do, I I want to see what they get so badly. His price is going to be fascinating. Yeah, for sure. That brings us to the Lakers. Um, another should we sit this one out? Should we skip over them? <laughs> I was going to say this is this is like walking into a minefield for me. Um, but they're another team that obviously has interest in Andre Iguodala. Again, I just don't think they have the necessary contracts to trade for him. It makes no sense to put Danny Green in a trade. Contavious Caldwell Pope has the no trade clause. Um, so it's difficult to get him there by trade. And if Memphis is really determined to move him instead of go the buyout route, um, it, it's just going to be tough for them to get there. One player that I think is interesting for a lot of different teams, and specifically the Lakers, because they their their salary um, hierarchy is really interesting. Like obviously LeBron and AD are making a ton of money. Danny Green and and maybe Caldwell Pope are like the only two in that sort of middle range in terms of annual salary. And then there's a lot of really small contracts, so it's hard to it's it's hard to come up with any trades for the Lakers just because of the salary matching rules. But Alec Burks is a guy who's making 2.3 million this season. And so a lot of the issues that you have for salary matching with, with trades around the league, just, they kind of go away with Alec Burks. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what Golden State wants for him. But that same Thompson report that I've said it a couple times now, and in there there's a little nugget that says that Alec Burks is the most likely to be traded. He's been good this season. He's averaging 16 points a game, shooting 37% from three. Um, he can score, and I think he could be a, a good boost to that that team's bench. That's a team that I think needs some depth. Um, so if they were able to get him for, you know, a salary that's similar to his and maybe a second round pick, I think that's something they, they, they should absolutely be thinking about. Yeah. He was actually my pick for the Lakers as well. My top choice. So I, I have alternatives, but he makes so much sense because it's so tough for the Lakers to cobble together these deals where they bring back real salary. And let's use Bogdan Medanovic as an example. I think he'd be a great fit in LA but if you're going to, one, send out the value that it might take to get him while matching salary, you're probably looking at Horton, Tucker, Cook, Kuzma for uh, Bogey and let's Caleb Swanigan. That works. And then, you're, you know, the, the Swanigan is the filler part. Uh, or does DeMarcus Cousins get involved in that deal as salary filler? So that's what you were looking at. And those deals are just so tough to concoct. And I'm not sure that if they want to trade Horton, Tucker – uh, either and Kuzma at the same time. And I have no idea how valuable the Lakers consider Kuzma still internally. Uh, there was a lot of just chatter that he was the player they really wanted to keep in Anthony Davis negotiations. And I don't, I don't not believe that. It's just that I don't know that there was a need for the Pelicans to have Lonzo Ball, Ingram, and Kuzma. They just made more sense for them to push for extra picks or, or extra pick swaps. Uh, if someone other than Burks, though, where that I think that they could get to matching his salary, you don't give up Kuzma in this deal. Uh, Langston Galloway, just someone who could really get off some threes and maybe helps you uh, run the offense when LeBron isn't on the court because the Lakers are decidedly losing those minutes. They're even worse in those minutes when it's Rondo on the court. You could also look at Wayne Ellington. Hasn't really been shooting the ball that well this year in New York, but he's been a, a guy who can knock down trays and, and can do it off motion. Uh, those would be the names to keep an eye on for me. And then I, I really like the Alec Burks fit. He's been passing the ball pretty well this season too. And so he helps you navigate those LeBron list minutes as well. For sure. That, that, that Alec Burks just jumped out to me on that one. Um, Memphis Grizzlies. At one point I had Dante Exum as a target for them. That's kind of out obviously. Um, I, so I love Memphis's young core. Again, this isn't, you know, some <laughs> real original thing to say, but John Morant looks a lot better than I thought he would right off the bat. I think the future front court of Brandon Clark and Jaron Jackson is just off the charts. I don't love Kyle Anderson at the three. I would, I would prefer that he's a four, but I could see him there. Um, and then Dylan Brooks has been good at the two, but I think that's one spot where they can explore, you know, are, are there some other guys that maybe have higher upside? And I think Malik Beasley is a really interesting option for them. If, if he's suddenly plugged into this young core, um, I, I just really, really like the fit there. He can shoot the ball. He One thing that's, I, I think, a little underrated about him is how athletic he is. Uh, last season, it was, was kind of his breakout for the Nuggets, and he's been in and out of the rotation this year, so it's been harder for him to show things. But on top of all the threes he hit, he had so many finishes on top of the rim. 
Um, just an extremely bouncy guy, uh, good in transition. I, I think Malik Beasley would fit really, really well alongside uh, John Morant. They, there would there would obviously be some growing pains on defense. That's a lot of young guys. Um, really, the only one who has like special defensive upside is probably Jaron Jackson. Maybe I throw J- Brandon Clark in there too. I, I think he's really good as well. But um, I, I don't think you have to worry that much about that if you're Memphis. I mean, this is clearly the rebuilding timeline. They're actually maybe a little bit ahead of schedule. But I think if there's one spot where they could – you know, see if there's there's a talent upgrade out there. It's probably the two. Yeah, I'm I'm with you there as well. And he was a name that I pinpointed for them too. Uh, they are just over the, just to step on the toes of of your point about them maybe being ahead of schedule. Over the past month, they are ten and six and fourth in offensive efficiency. Mm. They've just been nuclear uh, during that stretch and eleventh in net rating overall. The thing with me, and so when I went into this, I assumed that if they brought back anything that might be worth noting, it's because they're selling. Does a Jay Crowder deal bring you back Malik Beasley from Denver? I honestly do not know. I think yeah. my guess would yeah. probably be no there. But I, I again, he's so cheap that maybe there's something, Malik Beasley that is, maybe there's something that could be worked. But I don't want to see them buy. Uh, so some other names I had circled were just guys with lower value that they could get perhaps in a in a Jay Crowder deal or even for less, maybe a Justin Jackson who doesn't play a ton in Dallas, um, a Denzel Valentine in from, from Chicago, just sort of these, I don't want to say they're second draft guys necessarily because I think Justin Jackson's actually good. Uh, Valentine's been up and down in Chicago this year, but someone that they can plug at the two or try and get away with at the three and just really see see how it works. And it's, it's to get them without actually buying because I don't want to see them give up any future assets in any of any of their prospective deals. Yeah, and I think that's that makes plenty of sense. They're certainly a team that's in a position to do that. But look, if Malik Beasley's fairly cheap, if it's Crowder and they have to attach, you know, a second round pick or something, I would be I'd be comfortable with that because he does to me, like you said, he he seems like a a great fit there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that brings us to the Minnesota Timberwolves, and this is another possible Chris Paul spot for me. Um, they they got to do something, and I don't know if this is the right thing to do, but I don't know if we talked about this on the podcast yet or not, but the <laughs> rumblings around Carl Anthony Towns' trades already when he's got uh, five years on his deal after this one. Um, we've well, only like, four. Give him some credit. Only four <laughs> years left. It's, it's just gotten absurd, but – this is just sort of the nature of operating one of these smaller market teams in the NBA. You've got to be prepared for this. Um, and, and it's, you know, probably not wise to overreact to the report if there's any truth to it. Um, but they, they do need to get better. They got to surround him with better players. I think something built around Andrew Wiggins actually makes some sense. Um, maybe not as much for OKC, although, you know, maybe they're a team that says, we can get more out of him than Minnesota did. I, I, I think this makes a lot more sense for Minnesota than OKC is what I'm trying to say. Um, but this is one spot where I think the Chris Paul deal is not um, a terrible idea. I would I would agree with you. I wonder if, if this were the beginning of the season and Towns were healthy and the playoffs still seemed like a possibility. Yeah. I'm wondering if it's just a deal. I don't actually, I, I like the... I like the idea, particularly if you're giving up Andrew Wiggins in the process. But even if you're build, building something around Gorgie Jang, I don't, I wouldn't I hate it. But then it, you get into the point where you're probably going three for one at that point, and maybe you need another team. But I just, are they close enough to the playoffs this season? I mean, they're only two losses out of the eight spot. But is that is that the play you're making? Paul's been good, but he has two years, and I think it's eighty six and change left on his deal. He uh eighty five point six million left on his deal. It's just it's such a commitment. If you were giving up Andrew Wiggins in the process, I would do it. I'm not even. I'm still out on Andrew Wiggins. He's been better this season, but yeah. a lot of the good vibes from earlier in the year have faded. He's, his efficiency is plummeting. I was gonna say he's he's rapidly returning to the levels he was previously at. And again, I think this makes way more sense for the Timberwolves than it does for the Thunder because it's I. If we were to pinpoint the least tradable or least desirable contracts in the league, Wiggins is probably still in that conversation. Yes, for sure. And so that kind of made it 
maybe not tough to pinpoint targets for me, but I went into this assuming that they wouldn't really be, they, they might be like low buyers where their primary target probably comes back in a Robert Covington deal. And maybe that's a Malik Beasley. He's another guy. He's a, this is another team where I think he would fit. We th- we've thrown his name out there so much now. Some offbeat suggestions though, or one offbeat suggestion. They have interest in Dennis Smith Jr. Reportedly, if they can get him for just a, a, a paltry offer, I'm all for it just to try it. Jeff Teague's coming off the books. I kind of like the idea of Jared Culver as your primary ball handler for stretches, but th- that's a guy who I think could use a, a change of scenery again after leaving Dallas and then just what whatever happens in New York. So I wouldn't mind seeing him in Minnesota depending on the cost. However, if they're going to buy, what about Aaron Gordon? That's a yeah, that's a name that would be fascinating next to Carl Anthony Towns. I tend to think that I'd rather have Covington long-term at the four, but Gordon, when you're just looking at defensively, is just more equipped to handle the centers, but he can chase around wings and, and he can switch. And so that would be a name that I'd be interested to see next to Carl Anthony Towns. And I'm just wondering, you know, can you do Rocco and Teague for Gordon and, you know, is it is it Augustine? And then who is is that does Orlando need to send you a couple of picks in that scenario? I actually don't when I was trying to come up with specific deals, um, the one I settled on was Augustine, Gordon, and a second round pick or two from Orlando for Teague and Rocco. And I don't know if that was Orlando giving up too much or if it's still Minnesota giving up too much. That was something difficult to peg, but I would be very intrigued to see a Carl Anthony Towns, Aaron Gordon front court together long term. And Gordon's salary, it's on a declining scale, and he's young enough that he kind of fits whatever timeline Minnesota ends up embracing. Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't think about that possibility, but after you laid out the case, that that's fascinating to me. I'm not going to lie, I didn't want to lay it out because I have Aaron Gordon listed a couple times now before the end of the slideshow, and so I was trying to be just think of something different, but it's different in terms of what I think has been talked about for Minnesota and their, their situation is tough because I don't think that they would buy buy in that sense. You know, like I don't think if there was a Andrew Wiggins, Chris Paul trade available, I absolutely think they do it, but I don't think there's going to be an Andrew Wiggins trade available. Probably not. Um, That brings us to the new Orleans Pelicans. And I'm going to preface this one by saying that on a recent uh, hoop collective podcast, Brian Windhorst of ESPN, said that uh, the Pelicans are actually looking to be buyers, potentially. Um, and and David Griffin seeing sort of, the, and we mentioned this earlier, what a difference Derek Favors made. He's, uh, at least according to Windhurst, Windhorst, curious to know what another veteran in the rotation might do. And so this is another potential Alec Burks spot for me. Um, Ooh, I like it. Would would the Warriors have any interest in Frank Jackson, maybe? I mean, the, the advanced <laughs> numbers have been awful for him th- throughout his very short career. But he's 21 years old. I mean, he showed a little bit of um, playmaking and shooting ability at Duke. Not as much here in the NBA. Um, but but maybe that's a guy, if you attach a pick, that, that interests um, the Warriors. It, it wouldn't be terribly difficult salary-wise for the Warriors to pull this off. Um, Josh Hart, maybe, and I don't, I don't know if New Orleans is giving up too much at that point. I think Alec Burks is certainly better than Josh Hart right now, but obviously Josh Hart is a lot. He's not a lot younger. He's four years younger. Um, he gives and, you more and, defensive optionality too. I think that's true. Yeah, he's he's more switchable than Alec Burks, um, and he's cheaper. I, I, well, I don't know if he's cheaper, but he's under contract for next season. Where Burks, I do not believe is. That's true. That's a big deal too. Um, long story short, they do have some contracts they can send back to the Warriors to, to match that little salary for Burks. Um, and if they want to throw in a second round pick or something, maybe that sweetens the deal. But that's that's a veteran that I think could be interesting in New Orleans. Yeah, I actually like that. And I think if you, if it's just filler and a second round pick, that's something that you could look at. I Seeing that them being buyers was, it wasn't tough for me to understand, but I'm, I'm like, what do you give up? Is this a situation where you consider selling high on Lonzo Ball because you know you're going to pay Brandon Ingram? That'd be wild. This yeah. offseason? But then I don't know what trade is out there for them where it's worth giving him up to that degree. Uh, two names that I cited, and it was them as basically mini buyers. Uh, Dario Saric, who I don't know. He's going to be a restricted free agent this summer. Maybe you'd like to get a look at him uh, at the four and lineups with uh, Zion at the five. Or 
I, this is what someone I really like. Doesn't really fit their timeline unless they're ready to compete next year. But uh, Bogey in Sacramento seems like he'd be a great fit on this roster. And so, what yeah. can you sweeten? You have the Etwan Moore contract as an anchor, or even D- Darius Miller because he could be viewed as expiring since his second year is not guaranteed. What can you attach to it to make it worthwhile? I wouldn't give up Lonzo Ball for either of these players, but if you're going to buy, uh, those would be two names where I don't think the cost would be astronomical. Uh, I just wonder what New Orleans would would have to give up. Yeah, those are interesting targets uh, for sure for them. Um, That brings us to the Oklahoma City Thunder. You're going to love this. Um, Andrew Wiggins? (laughs) Well, again... I don't I don't know how aggressively Oklahoma City wants to pursue a Chris Paul trade right now. They might be loving these good vibes and the fact that they're going to go to the playoffs with this team um and just kind of want to ride it out this season and I wouldn't blame them if they wanted to do that. They've got a they've got a fan base that has barely I think they've missed the playoffs twice since Oklahoma City has or since the Thunder have been in OKC um so they're used to playing into the summer and and I you know I'm I'm totally fine with them sticking as is um but this is something that you've brought up to me a few times and I I've warmed to it over the course of the season but if OKC targeted Mike Conley um not necessarily for a basketball fit, although they, they may still be a, a pretty dang good team if Mike Conley rebounded and, and played like he did last season for OKC. Um, it just really lessens the burden on them financially. His contract is guaranteed for $34.5 million next season, but that's going to save them a ton of money over what's left on Chris Paul's deal, which is $41.4 million next season and then forty four point two the season after that. So it just opens up a lot of flexibility for OKC, it gets some cap space a little bit sooner. Um, so I think that's something that that maybe they could at least look at. I'd be here for it. They were, I know you said that maybe they wouldn't be as open to a Chris Paul trade, but I wrote something on why the Thunder shouldn't, bre- they shouldn't break up the Thunder this year, basically settling on if there was a good deal for Chris Paul out there, they probably would have made it already. And that's that G- Gallo yeah. might be more valuable actually as a sign and trade asset this summer when there are there are so few teams with cap space right after i writ, wrote that before it was even published Woj went on sports center and said that okc is open for business and they're willing to move <laughs> uh you know schroeder adams chris paul daniel gallinari so justice winslow is a guy for me if you're gonna trade gallo or chris paul i think either one of them would be fantastic fits in miami i think that's yeah. the guy you aim to get back in that deal and that's why i have him listed However, OKC has been wilding over the past basically month and a half. So maybe yep. they elect to keep this team together and become mini buyers, in which case the names I have pinpointed for them would be Reggie Bullock or, or Jay Crowder, someone where they don't have to give up um, a first. I don't think you give up first round picks or any of those guys, and you could attach um, one of your salary matching tools. You know, Andre Robertson's expiring, and then uh, – well, for Bullock, you I don't, you wouldn't even need to go that far, but then you attach a you know two second round picks or something to it, and that'd be something I'd be comfortable with them doing, just because why not just see what you can do this season? And you have so many picks in in the stable that I don't think you can look at that as anything close to uh, a franchise operating outside of its timeline by giving up too many future assets. Yeah, I think all options should be on the table for them, but again, I just I wouldn't blame them if they just went for it. This year and in going for it for them might mean a first round exit. And, and given what they gave up this summer, I think that's fine. Um, it was, it, to, to me, it was a resounding success the last several months for the Thunder. That brings um, us to the Phoenix Suns. Who you got? Yeah. They were hard for me. They're hard for me too. And I kind of went with a cop out. It's, it's something that's been out there. Um, but it's one of the few teams that I think could talk themselves into Kevin Love. Um, I mean, defense is, this is, we are all in an on offense type of a move. If you've got Kevin Love, DeAndre Ayton, Devin Booker on the floor, um, you're going to give up points and droves, but you're, you're also going to be able to score quite a bit too. Um, he gives them another big name to maybe bring a little bit more attention back to the Suns. I don't know how much, um, but I, I guess my, you know, long story short, I think this is one team where where Kevin Love might 
makes some sense. His his monster contract is just really difficult to deal. Um, but if there's a team out there that could maybe talk themselves into it, it's the Suns. I maybe I wouldn't. How I, excited I, did I sound at the end of that? By the way, you did not sound excited <laughs> at all, and that's why the Suns were tough for me because I don't really think they should be buying for now. I think they should be buying for the future. And Kevin Love yeah. doesn't do it for me. They were an, another Aaron Gordon destination for me, where it's does Ty Jerome and Tyler Johnson and you know they don't have a second round pick until 2022 does that get it done uh is that too much for them but I think Aaron Gordon next to eight and long term maybe don't end up paying Saric or uh Baines this summer is that a deal could it be Saric and Johnson two future seconds is yeah so, is is the framework of Jerome Saric and Tyler Johnson too much for Aaron Gordon I don't think it it would be and so then you could get a filler salary from Orlando as well. So it's only three for two. I'm not saying give up all of those things. Tyler Johnson's the anchor there. But that this seems like a team that would be a really good Gordon destination. I would be here for them trading Kevin Love just, just to see what happens. I don't think it's the smart move, but I think he does fit. And the reunion with Ricky Rubio and then having Devin Booker, yeah. his, his offensive role gets simplified. And I do think he's best, I wouldn't say his third option, but when he has someone reliable to feed him the ball yep. in his spots, whether it's uh, you know by the elbows or from beyond the arc, and both Booker and Rubio can do that for him. Hell, Kelly Oubre Jr. can do that for him better than Colin Sexton. <laughs> you sold Kevin Love to the Suns better than I did. Well done. Um, and I'm against it, which is what makes it fun. <laughs> so the next team is the Portland Trailblazers. I'm going to get a little bit wild again. This is something that you and I have discussed in uh, text messages. Um, ben Simmons as a possible... Um, I guess I guess they're like hyper athletic version of Draymond Green alongside Damian Lillard, and I think it makes some sense for uh, the Sixers too. If they got CJ McCollum back, uh, maybe you make him more of a point guard than he's been in in uh, Portland, and he's certainly spaced. Again, this is a lot of the same reasons that people think D'Angelo D'Angelo Russell would fit in Philadelphia. CJ McCollum can space the floor; he can run the pick and roll with Joel Embiid. Um, again, this is something that probably can't happen this season, uh, but it's, it's an interesting idea. And, and we even talked about too, what if, what if Portland was, um, not afraid to play some Ben Simmons at the five minutes. And I think the personnel that they could surround him with would make that a more palatable option than it is in, in Philadelphia too. So Ben Simmons in Portland is interesting to me. And I should also add, and I wrote about this in the, the Bleacher Report NBA Digest that just published this morning. I don't think Philadelphia should trade Ben Simmons. I think he's, I'm with you. I think he's wildly underrated. Um, people focus too much on the one thing that he can't do. Um, but if, if there is some real conversation within the Sixers front office that they don't like the fit of Simmons and Embiid, and they think Embiid has a higher long-term ceiling, um, this, this is a possible destination for him. Yeah, in the offseason, for sure. And the framework, I don't know that much. I wouldn't do it if I'm the Sixers from McCollum straight up, even if he fits your roster better. There needs to be picks or... Other yeah, players I involved. Agree. I don't know if you get Simons and McCollum in that deal, uh, but that'd be something. If the Sixers do decide to move on from Simmons, that'd be something to monitor in the off season. And I know Philly fans have come out against the Ben Simmons at the five model because it hasn't really worked when they've gone to it in Philly. The sample size is just so small, and the personnel on some of these other teams is so different that I still think it's a it's a possibility, a lineup framework that could be really effective. For the Blazers, I went with – they need wings who could defend and preferably shoot yeah. more from three uh, than Harkless and Aminu did for them. Robert Covington is my top target for them. I think they can go the, hey, we'll give you a young player, Nasir Little, and a first-round pick, and then filler. Uh, the other thing that I thought about for them, they should go for a Jay Crowder, Andre Godala mega deal where it's – would they give up a first-round pick protected and then they have the filler salary where it could basically just be white side for those two. And it yeah. works. Uh, so yeah. that's something I should explore. I also said, what about a Marcus Morris, Morris Reggie Bullock trade? Uh, there's value in getting Morris, even though he's not a bird rights free agent, because on his non bird rights at a $15 million salary, you still have the flexibility to keep him. And so that would be something that they could look at. This was another, possibly not my favorite, but another Aaron Gordon destination as well. Yeah. So they have the filler salary to make that work. The thing where I'd be uneasy, Kemp Bazemore hasn't been good but I don't want to give up if I'm the Blazers any wings, regardless of who they are at this point, just because they have so few 
healthy ones, but it wouldn't be a deal breaker for me because you're not going to build that deal around Hassan Whiteside. It just doesn't make sense when Orlando, maybe they'd get rid of him right away, but you have Vooch and you have Bamba. I know Isaac's injured, but they have Kem Birch. So I, I would consider Aaron Gordon as well if he's available and I'm the Blazers. Yeah. Aaron totally. Gordon that, at the five in Portland while Yusuf Nurkic is that out. That would be fun too. Aaron Gordon's destiny may be at the five. Um, and speaking of Aaron Gordon, that's actually my target. I, I kept kind of smirking over here every time you mentioned him um, <laughs> because he does make sense in a lot of spots. And I think Sacramento is maybe one of them. I haven't thought real deeply about what Sacramento would have to send back to Orlando to make that happen. Um, but I think their future, like if, if all those guys are going to work out, like pr- let's just focus on Marvin Bagley first. I think he's a five. Um, and they've, they've kind of pigeonholed him into the four right now, but I think if he's going to make sense and really work in the NBA long-term, he needs to be a five. And I think Aaron Gordon's an interesting guy to place alongside him at the four. Um, and, and if, if Bagley's your five and healed is your two and Fox is your one, I think you're going to need some defense at those other spots. Oh, do you? And I think Aaron, <laughs> Aaron Gordon can provide some of that. So he's an interesting guy, uh, for the Sacramento Kings to me. He is on my list. Wasn't my top choice for them. The thing I'd be concerned about, and I, I love the, the fit functionally, but when you have Rachon Holmes playing so well and you have Marvin yeah. Bagley, do you want to make that investment in another combo big, basically? Understandable. I, I would still love it, though, especially if, you know, if you're going to just, I don't know what the exact deal would look like, but you, you could get rid of Trevor Reza's expot. Maybe it's Bogey and Trevor Reza for Aaron Gordon. I would do that deal if I'm the Kings. Uh, so it, I like it. Um, what I went with for them is I'm assuming or Maybe I shouldn't assume this because it's the Kings, but if they do make a move, they're going to be sellers. And I think they need to target, they need wing prospects, uh, even distressed wing prospects that are have a couple years left on their deal, uh, at, just under cost control. And so I think the target should be one of those, maybe attached with a pick in a bogey deal. So the, the names I have listed would be, um, can you get Zaire Smith, maybe a second or two from Philly? Um, and then they have Mike Scott as well to make the filler work for bogey. I don't think... Uh, I'm, I'm sure the Kings' preference in, and many other teams' preference in a deal with the Sixers would be, can they get Fiebel? I, I just don't think that they would for, for Bogey. Uh, another interesting one is, what if the Raptors decide to be mini buyers and they say, here's Norman Powell in a first-round pick for, for Bogey? Yeah. I, I would consider that if I'm the Kings in, in a heartbeat. So that's what I have listed for them. And then uh, Aaron Gordon was there as well. All right, that brings us to the San Antonio Spurs. This one's going to be a little bit weird Two, and I put Hassan Whiteside um, just because he's on an expiring contract. There's been the buzz about LaMarcus Aldridge wanting to go back to Portland. Um, this gives San Antonio some flexibility. Like if, if they ever think, okay, we need to go ahead and rebuild, this helps get them there faster. And I think it actually might – this one might be harder for Portland to to accept actually i mean lamarcus aldridge is getting towards the end of his career um i I think you exacerbate some defensive problems that portland already has if he's suddenly your center um the story is cool like you know lamarcus aldridge and damian lillard reunited for one last run together um but it, it might be difficult to actually sell to the blazers but for the spurs um They've been frisky lately, and LaMarcus Aldridge has suddenly started shooting threes, and they're winning games, and so they're back in the playoff hunt. But I don't think anybody could realistically call them a title contender. Um, and, it, you know, they don't necessarily have to be in that title or bust mentality, but when you've won five in the last 20 years or whatever it's been, um, you're, you're generally kind of held to a higher standard. And I think they're going to get back to contention faster if they blow it up into a, a true rebuild. I agree. I don't see them blowing it up, though. I would like to see I, them. I don't either, to be honest. I mean, I, I think this is a long shot. And generally speaking, um, it seems like the Spurs are, are intent on staying competitive. And uh, th- they're just turnaround recently. I know it's a small sample size. They were 30th in three-point attempt rate over their first 30 games. 30th. Over their last six, they're, six, they're 16th. Finally. That's Finally. Like, Who knew that shooting threes could help you win games? But it's just, that's like, even over a small sample size, that's just a monster. Yeah, that's progression. Huge. Uh The name I have for them, so I have two, and I'm operating under the assumption that they're either going to be quasi-buyers or outright buyers. They're another Aaron Gordon destination for me. If Orlando really does have interest in DeMar DeRozan, there's some pretty easy permutations to go with between yeah, the two sure. teams. The other one I have listed, though, and I'll blow through the deal that I have proposed, 
was a three teamer was Kevin Love. I'd love to see Kevin Love in San Antonio, and I think I, I think maybe you could make it work with Aldridge at the five next to him, or you just make an effort to to stagger their minutes. And you're basically saying that you don't want Aaron Gordon necessarily in this scenario, but the deal would be Demar Derozan to Orlando. Aaron Gordon and Wes Awandu to Cleveland, and then Love to San Antonio. Maybe San Antonio gets seconds there because of of Love's deal. Maybe Orlando has to include a second round pick. And if I'm Cleveland, I jump because to get Gordon for Love, he's not as good of a player, but he just fits your timeline better, and he's on a cheaper salary as well. Totally agree with that. Which brings us to the Utah Jazz. Um, I think they're probably done making moves for the for this season. They've already made a move. Jordan Clarkson addition has been helpful. I think the bench is certainly looks a lot better than it did before he got there. Um, it helps that all the the starters are playing out of their minds right now too. Um, but I'm gonna guess they probably stand pat. One thing that's interesting about that trade though, and I didn't know it until a bunch of people reported it after it happened. Um, Jordan Clarkson can be traded again in a one for one deal. And because his his salary was incrementally higher than Exum's, Utah can now trade for players whose salaries are incrementally higher than Clarkson's. Um, and so they've put themselves in the Andre Godala sweepstakes, who I, th- I think would be interesting in Utah. Now, I, I, Jordan Clarkson's been better than I expected and maybe better than Utah expected. And so maybe they like his scoring punch off the bench a little bit more than the idea of a 36-year-old switchy defender in Iguodala. But they've certainly given themselves a, a few more options that they can go after now that they've completed that trade. And I don't have any names for this, but they could also be in the market for a backup center. Uh, Ed Davis just hasn't worked out for whatever reason. Tony Bradley's been decent um, stepping up in his place, but I, I think if they could, they would probably upgrade there too if, they, if, if there's a deal out there. Wow, it's funny. I mentioned that Clarkson thing to you too, but you needed the official reports before you bought into the <laughs> maybe. The idea. Maybe it was you who uh, broke the news to me. I guess if you Clarkson in what two seconds, uh, they can't. They don't have a second before twenty twenty one, and it's not even their own. Uh, After uh, seeing how he's played, though, I'm not like I'm not dying to see that deal, Andre Iguodala for Clarkson. Like I, I think they're they third in offensive rating off since uh, the Clarkson trade. So, yeah, that's yeah. So so I don't know. My target was backup center for them, uh, a Noah Vonley, just not a part of Minnesota's plans. And I think oh, yeah. uh, just because backup center isn't a prominent role in Utah, I'd like to see what he could do there. And he, he shouldn't cost you much at all. And then if they wanted to get another wing, it would have to be on the cheaper side because I don't think you want to give up Clarkson at this point. Um, Reggie B from the Knicks, that would be another name for them to monitor there. Those are just my – I think they're done too, though, so I didn't really spend too much time. I, I yeah. would really cape for Noah Vonley in Utah, though. I was going to say, as, as soon as you mentioned his name, I kind of perked up. That's he, He's interesting. Um, it would be nice if they could sort of switch it up and have a floor spacing five from time to time, and I think Vonley can be that. Well, we powered through the Western Conference. I'll be honest with you. I was I was a little dubious before we started this morning. Can we really power through trade targets for every Western Conference team in about an hour? And we did it. So shout out to Depending us. Depending on how long your close is, it might even be under an hour. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Speed up here. Um, as always, if you want to give us your thoughts on the podcast and give us your own trade targets, whatever you want to do, find us on Twitter at Dan Favale, F-A-V-A-L-E. I'm at Andrew D. Bailey. The show is at Hardwood Knox. The, the, uh, <laughs> the platform uh, podcast network, there it is, at Blue Wire Pods. As always, we encourage you to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. If you've done so already, tell your friends and family to. And until next time, we leave you with a shout-out to Ben Udry and Kyle Anderson.